What we're doing today is a very quick introduction to the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, as you know, there are many different kinds of churches and Christians in the world, but almost all of those Christians can be grouped into one of four big traditions. Catholicism, which accounts for half of the Christians in the world. Orthodox Christianity, which accounts for about 10%. Protestantism, which accounts for another 20%. And finally, the Pentecostal tradition, which accounts for about 20% of all the Christians in the world. But today we're talking about that big, big slice of the pie. Half of the Christians in the world, 1.1 billion people around the world who are Catholics. Where do Catholics live? Uh, almost half of the Catholics in the world now live in Latin America. Just a little bit less than half the Catholics. These are countries where more than half the population, half of the Christians are Catholic in these, these countries. This talk will have five parts. First, a little uh, introduction to Catholic history. Then something about the structure and order of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, a discussion of Catholic worship and Catholic sacraments. The Catholic view of salvation. And finally, the Catholic intellectual tradition will be the last part that we talk about. Let's start with Catholic history. Uh, Catholic history, like Orthodox history, goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. As you know, Christianity spread rapidly across the Roman Empire. Uh, and the Latin-speaking half, Christians in the Latin-speaking half of the old Roman Empire, would eventually become Catholic Christianity, Catholic Church. Uh, Rome is very important for the Catholic tradition. And the church at Rome is reported to have been founded by both the apostles Peter and Paul. That gave it special status. But founding by Peter was especially important for later bishops of Rome and for the Catholic tradition, because Jesus himself said to Peter, Peter, you are this rock, and I will build my church on you, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Peter seems to have a special role assigned to him by Jesus. And the bishops of Rome ever since have claimed that same place of prominence in the church globally. This is the symbol for the papacy. It's a three-tiered tiara, and then the keys of the kingdom that were given to Peter. Uh, Orthodox Christianity and Catholic Christianity shares almost 1,000 years of history. But around the year 1054, these two traditions finally separated. Sometimes it's called the Great Schism. It was after this separation, after the Orthodox tradition is clearly separate from the Catholic tradition, that a number of things that we think of as distinctively Catholic first became part of the Catholic tradition. So it's only in the medieval period, between the years 1100 and 1400, that things like clerical celibacy and clerical garb, the fact that priests can't be married, and the fact that priests ought to wear clothing that sets them apart from other people, becomes part of the rules of the Catholic Church. There's some sort of basic Catholic doctrines, too, like purgatory or transubstantiation, the fact that the bread and the wine and the communion become the actual body and blood of Christ. These theologies, these doctrines, weren't finally and fully defined until the medieval period, 1100 to 1400. And finally, this is the time when a lot of new monastic orders are started, orders like the Franciscans or like the Dominicans. And there's a number of other religious orders of monks and nuns that are created during this time. So that's a little bit of the history of the Catholic Church. The Church and the Papacy. Catholic Christians, like Orthodox Christians, see the Church itself as the body of Christ. The Church as an organization, the Church as an institution. The Church is the body of Christ on Earth. That one Church, according to the way Catholics think, needs to have one earthly head to keep it united, and that one earthly head is the pope. The chief, the chief role of the papacy, who is the bishop of Rome, the pope, is to ensure the unity of the church and fidelity to proper teaching of the gospel. The structure of the Catholic Church looks like this. There is one pope at the top, but only one. Then there are lots of bishops and archbishops, about 4,000 of them worldwide. Then there's lots of priests, priests who are not married now, even though at one point in Catholic history they could be. And then the people, 
Okay, and sometimes it's the Pope, the Bishop, and the Priest are referred to as the Church, and the people are referred to as the people. But that's becoming less and less a norm in Catholicism, where the whole body, the people and the priests and the bishops and the Pope together make up the Church. The Catholic tradition also has a prominent place for monks and nuns, people who take special religious vows. But unlike in the Orthodox Church, where there's a lot of interaction, especially between monks and ordinary believers, in the Catholic tradition, monks and nuns generally have separate roles, separate roles to play. Uh, uh, many nuns were teachers at one point in time, uh, but they're a little bit more separate from the rest of the Church than they are in Orthodoxy. The power of the Pope in Catholic history has not always been the same. It's fluctuated, rising and lowering. It reached a peak with Pope Innocent III around the year 1200. And it reached a low point around the, in the late 1700s during the French Revolution when the French crown, the French, the French Revolution took over the church and began to run it. And since the time of the, of the French Revolution, however, the, the power of the papacy in the church and in the world has increased significantly. An important date is 1870 when the doctrine of papal infallibility was declared by the church. Now, papal infallibility does not mean that everything the pope says has to be taken as absolute truth. Only when the pope says he's speaking infallibly does the pope speak infallibly. It's only happened once, actually. Uh, Catholic worship in the sacraments. In the Catholic understanding of things, God's grace, Christ's merits, and the powers of the Spirit are funneled by God through the church to the people, primarily through the sacraments. Okay? Sacraments are ordinary things that communicate extraordinary holiness. Okay? In the Catholic tradition, there are seven sacraments. The first is baptism, the water of baptism itself conveys grace and holiness in some way. Another, another sacrament is confirmation. When you're old enough to affirm the faith for yourself, you are confirmed by the bishop, and you're anointed with oil. It's a sacrament that, that confers grace and holiness. There's the sacrament of penance, or reconciliation. When you, in conversation with a priest, examine your life, identify sin in it, confess it, and receive forgiveness from God. That's another sacrament. There are sacraments of holy orders, becoming a priest, and marriage. You can only do one or the other of these two things. But they're both considered sacraments. Marriage is a sacrament, a means of grace, just as ordination or becoming a priest is. And there's also the anointing of the sick. This used to be called last rites or extreme unction. It's at that point when a person seems like they're on the point of death. It's one last sacrament to provide grace for the transition out of this life into the next. The most important sacrament of all, however, is the Eucharist, the bread and the wine that becomes the body and blood of Christ. Uh, if you look at a Catholic church, everything about a Catholic church points to the importance of the Eucharist. The altar table is at the center of it. That was a medieval cathedral. This is the brand new cathedral of Los Angeles. And the same thing, all of the lines of the church point right toward the altar table and the Eucharist. And in Los Angeles, if you can't get the point from the architecture, they have tapestries on the walls, lining the walls, all looking forward at the altar table to emphasize the centrality of the Eucharist. In Catholic tradition, transubstantiation, the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. And by eating it, by eating it, literally by eating it, we are nourished by God's Spirit through the sacrament. The sacrament is considered so holy, once it's consecrated, once the wafer is consecrated, the host it's called, it is the body of Christ. And in many Catholic churches, they will reserve a host and put it on display in a monstrance like this, where people can come in and worship and meditate and pray in the presence of the body of Christ. I mean, it's a very strong understanding of what happens to the bread and the wine. Catholic view of salvation. 
Catholic view of salvation works something like this. Catholics believe in something called original sin. And original sin is a defect in us when we're born that prevents God's grace from having an impact on us. Happily, however, the sacrament of baptism dissolves away original sin and allows God's grace to enter our hearts and we become children of God through baptism. Then you begin a lifelong journey of seeking holiness and moving towards God. The, the idea of conversion in the Catholic tradition, like in the Orthodox tradition, is a lifelong pattern. It doesn't have a single starting point and stopping point. That lifelong journey is aided by the sacraments for Catholics. It's also aided by things that are called sacramentals, like, like praying the rosary or going through the 14 stations of the cross. These are other kinds of activities that can help you become holy and accumulate God's grace. Uh, it's aided by pious acts, like going on pilgrimage. This is the famous pilgrimage road that goes across North Spain, uh, and it ends in Santiago de Compostela in northeastern, in northwestern Spain. And it's aided by serving the poor. This is Mother Teresa's House for the Dying in Calcutta. As a result of all those things, people themselves slowly become holy. The way this is supposed to work is like this. As you get older, you're supposed to grow in holiness. And when you went 100% holy, you get to go to heaven. You get to enter into heaven. There's a problem, however, because if you look around the world, a lot of people die here before they're obviously holy. And what happens then? What the Catholic tradition says is there is an experience or a place or a time called purgatory. And in that experience, however long or short it lasts, God completes the purification of people so that they can, in fact, enter heaven because they have been purified of sin and are holy enough to stand in God's presence. So in the, the smiley face version of salvation, it looks something like this. Uh, baptism removes original sin. We grow in holiness by the sacraments and by God's grace until we can stand in God's presence, the beatific vision of God. is what salvation looks like in the Catholic tradition. Finally, we come to the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, the Catholic tradition believes that God is revealed in nature. God made the world so God's fingerprints are all over it. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen, a wonderful nun from the medieval period, said, speaking in God's voice, I gleam in the waters, I burn in the sun, moon, and stars, with every breeze I awake at life. There's a strong sense that God is, spirit is present in creation. God is, is visible in some way in creation. The, the understanding in the Catholic tradition that God is the creator of both the church, God's the author of salvation and the gospel and the church, but God is also the creator of the world. Because of that, because both the church and the world are created by God, both of them should make sense. Catholics do not think God is irrational. Catholic thinks that God is very reasonable. And the world should make sense. Faith should make sense because God himself makes sense. But that also means that what we can learn about God from the world ought to correspond with what we learn about God through the, through the Bible, through Christian tradition, through the church. Christian truth and truth about the world ought to be compatible. Thomas Aquinas, perhaps the most famous philosopher of the medieval period, explained it this way. He said that belief, what we know by revelation, and reason needed to fit together. As a matter of fact, he said that when you combine belief with reason, you actually end up with knowledge. And he said it was the job of every Christian to move beyond mere belief and to move forward into knowledge as part of your maturation as a Christian and as a believer. This mixing of understanding that the world reveals things about God as well as the Christian tradition reveals things about God is really the foundation of theology as we know it today. And it's also the deep roots of the university. This is why Catholics in the medieval period created the first universities the world had ever, has ever known, 
and the universities that exist today are the lineal descendants of those old Catholic universities. And that, in a few minutes, is a very quick and short introduction to the Catholic tradition. <laughs>